Okay, so let me remind myself what we have seen before. As we talked about uh, the force on a wire, right? It is I dL cross D. So this explains the there's a current, so it's usually a closed loop. But so, but I'm, but this applies to even a small portion of it. So I didn't necessarily put the closed loop over here. Uh, DL is this way. Okay, and you can see I is also parallel to DL. And uh, uh, so some people actually. Uh, make this swap easy, and we should be comfortable doing both. I can put the vector on I as well. Change the vector symbol, because they point in exactly the same direction. Then we talked about uh, line currents, where I was equal to, in magnitude, lambda V, um, and then we got K surface current to be sigma V, and so when you have a surface current, and this is the perpendicular length, uh, the relationship between K and uh, the current is K, at least magnitude, dl over uh, di over dl part. And we also had volume current. So if you just have just current here, there, and everywhere, then the volume current density is rho v. It just goes from lambda to sigma to rho. And the expression for J is uh, di over d area perp. What's area perp? Well, if the current is going this way, you look at a cross-sectional area that is actually perpendicular to the current. That's where we are. And then we saw that conservation of um, um, charge. That means if I if I if you have a volume current, right? So maybe I can even denote this as J. And then if I took a closed surface, the amount of charge flowing out is J dot D A, and then you integrate that. Well, that should be equal to the rate of change of charge inside. You know what what flows out. If something flows out, that means something has decreased. Something conversely, if something flows in, something has increased in that region. And what is that something? It is charge. Charge can neither be created nor destroyed. Uh, so, and we get this continuity equation. This, you should be, your, now your calculus, uh, your divergence theorem should be um, so good that in one step you should realize that d tau being the volume is equal to minus j dot dA. If it takes you a few seconds to f uh, fill in the steps, that's all right. In fact, last time I lectured, we went from here to there. So it's just writing it backwards. Uh, they're, they're both exactly the same, but you see what I'm trying to tell you. If in a certain volume, uh, you consider the charge in it, the rate of change of charge in that volume is negative of what flows out. Okay, so J, if you will, is the current flux. 
So in order to do a specific problem that I will do shortly, let's consider this simple example of a, um, a spherical shell. Okay, and you have a uniform uh, charge Q placed on the shell, and this is R units long. I mean, the radius is R. And suppose now you take the shell and rotate it with some angular velocity omega. So you have a charred shell that's just rotating. So in the so, so this is a spherical shell. It's hollow. It's hollow inside. So on the surface of this object, there's going to be a current. Why? Because charges are moving around. So uh, the, the question is, what is um, our K? Because it's a surface current. So, I'm going to look at any portion over here. Remember, k. Now, k is going to be in this direction. I'll write it vectorially, we, but we know that because the charges are moving around in that direction. K, as you know, is sigma times V on, on the one hand. On the other hand, K is also equal to DI over DL perp. So a few things we already know. Sigma is very easy. It is Q over 4 pi R squared. Total charge divided by the area. Velocity, if something is moving in this direction, what's the velocity? V equals R omega. Except we have to be very careful. It is this distance we need. R omega, right? So uh, R sine theta, correct. R sine theta. Omega. Yeah, R cross omega. Yeah, that's where it come, came from. I'm not doing anything in, in uh, vector, but it's so easy to uh, make this vectorial because uh, you know from ENM1, tell me what's the vec uh, vector. How, what vector is that? I'll use spherical coordinate system, obviously. Let's see if you remember the spherical coordinate unit vectors. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, from here, I get di is equal to k dl prime. Uh, k is sigma v r sine theta omega d theta. That is correct. That sine theta is not coming from this. This is r d theta. You're right. But we have, in K is sigma V. Sigma K is sigma V R D theta. DL perp is R D theta. Are we good? Yeah, 
so good catch, Chip. Glad you asked that. So over here, you are right. This is DL purpose RD data. K is sigma V. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. If you want um, current, of course, you, you can I integrate this. But K, so, so what am I doing now? This is what I was looking for. Q over 4 pi r squared r sine theta omega and if you want to make it vectorial you can put phi hat uh, so this is the expression of course we can simplify it the current is in fact zero at the poles yeah. the current density Okay, good. So that's how these expressions come into play. And I want to state Vian Savat's uh, rule that tells you how to compute the magnetic field, but I don't know how to uh, spell. So this does not have any R dependence. Sigma has R squared. Okay. Let's hope all the factors, it, it'll fix itself. Uh, so this is something, we'll make sense of this later differently. We'll have a nice set of compact equations called Maxwell's equations. And this Biet-Savart's law will be a consequence of that under a certain uh, condition. But we're lo learning the story, we're building the story up. Y you know, even Coulomb's law, all of that will come about very quickly. But we're building the story, so let's write it as it was uh, obtained. So if you have a current carrying wire, so again, either D, L prime or even I. And suppose this current is steady, unchanging. In electrostatics, we had charges not moving. In this chapter, we're doing magnetostatics. We haven't started electrodynamics. That's chapter seven. So what is magnetostatics? Of course, you need charges move to move to create magnetic fields. You need a current. But it's still statics suggesting that current cannot just change over time. It, it has to be a steady current. So These are two people, Viet and Savart, V A R T. This expression tells you how this wire, because it carries a current, it creates a magnetic field. And it tells you, um, it gives you the expression for the magnetic field. So, given any point, let me establish a coordinate system. So let's say our coordinate system is over here. And somewhere over here, you want to ask, well, what is the magnetic field created? Well, let's look at this small chunk 
and see what's the magnetic field created to this chunk, and then we'll just add it up. So we'll need our usual vectors. So uh, this will be called, let me use a different color, your usual, it's a prime. So this locates the source. And so this is our prime. And from the source to where we're calculating the field, we would have the separation vector. Of course, the separation vector is nothing more than r minus r prime. Yeah? And the answer to this, now, what is curious is, how do you compute, how do you measure the magnetic field and come up with the expression that I'm going to write on the board? All right, there, there's got to be a constant because units have to work out. That's easy. And we'll talk about this constant, but let me just, you, you can call it whatever you want. You, 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 you know, it's just, that's just a thing that's given. And then you do this, and you say, hmm, this just makes sense. Everything falls off as 1 over r squared. All right, so that's a given. They sort of used that, I'm, I'm assuming. But now you need to get direction. Turns out that the magnetic field is perpendicular to this vector and that vector. DL vector and this vector. So DL prime, let me see, that's a source, right? That's why I'm putting it as prime. Are you happy? And of course, the more current you have, the more constant mu zero is called epsilon naught is the permittivity, correct? Mu naught is the permeability. Minus seven. Newton. I think we'll wrap your square bit of fun. Yeah, there are a couple of things I would like for you to focus here. First of all, we never really talked about the unit for magnetic field. It's, what is the unit for magnetic field? It's, uh, Tesla. Yeah, Tesla. So how do you get the unit for magnetic field? Well, that's easy. F, I'm not writing vectors. Well, so this is Newton. This is Coulomb's, right? So Newton, this is Coulomb. This is meters per second. Whatever this is, is Tesla. So Tesla is obviously what? One Tesla is Newton second over, let me write this as MC. M for meter, C for coulombs. I don't want to write CM. You might mistake it for centimeters. So that's what a Tesla is. Now, given that this is a Tesla, everything else you know. This is amperes. Um, this is length, meters. Um, unit vector, um, only the magnitude, it's still meters, but then you have meters squared. So this is dimensionless. 
so I would get Teslas over Ampere. So make sure that this unit is correct. And it is. Coulombs per second of amperes, right? So it is Newton. Yeah, from there you should verify that this is in fact true. Yeah, you get an ampere from here and an ampere from there. So you get ampere squared. Yeah, so the tricky part in, in this when, when they did it is really a matter of, well, a constant is a constant. You know, that, that is so that you're measuring things in the same unit. Is really knowing that it's more current, more magnetic field. But that part is easy. Direction, I mean, one over R squared, everything is one over R squared. Newton did gravitation, one over R squared. Coulomb, uh, Coulomb's law, let's throw it one over R squared. Well, why don't we just throw it this in? Yeah, um, and, and then the direction. And this is, if you have, and I, and I want to do a couple of problems. Let me, let me do one problem with this one. It's worked out in the book. There's another one that's worked out in the book that we won't do. Let me, but, but this is a standard problem. This is example 5.5. Something else I wanted to tell you. Oh, we may have done this uh, in ENM1. So you've seen epsilon naught and mu naught. Can you, what's the value for epsilon naught? Do you remember? Uh, we, we'll look it up. Yeah. Yeah, can you calculate this? Let me look up the value. Chip, you have a calculator as well? I want both of you to do it. Uh, epsilon naught, I'm looking it up. You should also look up the value for epsilon naught. It's 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 in SI units. See how did you actually yes. check the number or I crunched. I crunched the numbers. And you got three two point nine nine. Yeah. Yeah. So that this is in fact somehow the story this semester we'll have to tie all of this and get C out of it. It's easy to write that down, but what does that have any bearing to what we're doing? And you'll slowly find that to be the case. Now, using Beard Savant's law, let's find out. You have, in, I changed my coordinate system slightly from the book. Uh, this is nothing more than example 5.5. Um, the question is what's the magnetic field here? Well, okay, where's the wire? Where's the current? Let me look at the symbol they used. So, S. Okay, some distance x away from the uh, s away from the uh, x-axis. Well, what is creating the current? Obviously, a wire. So the wire is on the x-axis, but I'm just going to. Okay, 
Okay? There is a wire carrying current I. This is the source, so I'm putting prime. So what I'm going to do is, using Beard-Savard's law, integrate from this point to this. I mean, write it for some small values, and then we'll let it go to the entire. Like it's always that you know somehow you have to let it go to minus infinity to plus infinity. So d l prime is d x prime x hat. This is some distance x prime. We have to compute all of this. I is given to you. So what we will do is call this angle theta. And then immediately note that x prime equals s tangent theta. We have a dx. So we'll, we'll do dx prime. And I'll change this angle change the variable to theta. That's an easy, the re really I should put theta prime because it's still a source, but theta just stands by itself. We don't need to do that. dx prime, s is a constant. So what's the derivative of tangent theta? Secant squared. Secant squared theta, d theta. Fine. Uh, let's find this distance, which is this distance. So we lock out one more time. Turns out we won't have to do a difficult tangent squared theta. This is nothing more than s squared secant squared theta. Again. Then we need to, we know i, i is just a constant. We know what uh, dl prime is. We need this magnitude, and we'll write the direction. First of all, let's do uh, the direction. Where is this vector is from the source to that? Yeah? So what's the direction of this cross that? Coming out of the board. So B is in the Z direction. So I'll write that as BC. So that I don't need to write all of this factorially. We're, we're writing the only non-zero component. It is BC. That's equal to mu 0 over 4 pi. I, the current is constant. I pull it out of the integral. This guy, we took care of the direction. The magnitude is magnitude of this times magnitude of that times the sine of the angle between them. I know that magnitude of this is 1. The magnitude of dl prime is just dx prime. I need this angle, correct? But dx prime is written in terms of theta. I'm going to make a substitution. So whatever it is, I need to get this angle in terms of that angle. So let me temporarily call this beta and write this as sine of beta over, and the denominator is simply where we get lucky. It is s squared secant squared theta. The moment we realize uh, what beta is and replace this with this, the integral and everything becomes trivial. So to get beta, I'm going to write it, and I need to write it with respect to theta. So what's this angle? Pi minus beta. Now these two should add up to be what? 90 degrees. So pi minus beta plus theta equals pi over 2. So 90 
So theta is equal to pi over 2 minus pi, oh, rather beta. Beta is equal to pi minus pi over 2 plus theta. Correct? eventually going to feed everything to this integral of just computing all the pieces. So what is sine of beta? Sine of pi over 2. Sine of 90 plus theta is what? Cosine, Cosine of theta. OK, I believe we have done all the hard work. BZ, U0 of i over 4 pi. dx prime will be written as s secant squared theta d theta. Sine beta is going to be now written as cosine theta divided by s squared secant squared theta. And let's just go from some theta 1 to theta 2. And I'll tell you what we'll do later on. So this is mu 0 i over 4 pi s cosine theta d theta Integral of cosine theta is sine theta. But this is totally unnecessary, but sine theta, just because we can do an indefinite integral like this. But now what are we going to do? We need to get the entire wire as this goes to negative infinity. What does theta go to? So it's going to be uh, this line right here, right? Because There's an important lesson here. If you have, an, using Ampere's law, this will be written in a trivial way. But I'm about to, for lack of space, I'm about to erase part of the board. Uh, are you comfortable with the, the mechanics of the problem? Now, how do you remember this? You want to remember this as a useful result? Here's how you remember. You've seen this before as Ampere's law, we'll visit, and it's so easy to do it using Ampere's law. But suppose you have a current like this. This problem we did is no different from what's the magnetic field over here. 
and the magnetic field points like this. This is into the board. And if this distance is S magnitude itself, so I can write it vectorially now. I, because I changed that to z axis. This is cylindrical coordinate distance, distance s, but it's in the phi direction. So if you have a wire like this, use the right hand, place your thumb along the current, and the way your fingers curve is the direction of the magnetic field. This is a very, very important result. Happy? Chip? See, what, what I've done is the wire was this way. I just brought it up like that. So this point becomes here. It's coming up. Yeah. So in this problem, the magnetic field is like this. I mean, this is completely symmetric around the circle. So if it points this way, it's going to continue to point. Yeah, the secant squared canceling, because I wouldn't know what to, uh, you know, how, how to integrate. You know, these simple things, either if you're lucky, you can think of a trigonometric substitution, or else you're writing a Python code, or putting it in maple. Uh, are you a uh, Python person? Chip, do you uh, do Python? Uh, computer science one. <laughs> is that what they teach in computer science oh, one? C plus plus. C++. Isn't it more difficult than Python? Uh, I remember I started yet. <laughs> it is. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I know a lot of people that I've talked to in computer science think that Python is what should be taught, but yeah. it depends on the school, really. Like some schools have adopted Python, other ones Java, and then our, our school is C++. Uh, I suppose it doesn't really hurt to learn um, all three. And you know, if you, if you generally know coding, then it's roughly the same thing. The commands might differ. But yeah. So suppose I have force between. carrying conductors. We, we can make this all kinds of complicated if you, if you know this, this problem, as long as they're straight wires. So suppose I have this one carrying current I1, and this one carrying current I2, and let's say they're S units apart. What's the force? If, indeed, this expression is only true for an infinitely long uh, um, wire. So if, if there is force, the answer is going to be it's infinite. So what we can only do is find force per unit length. So let me make that as a very clear now correction. Because it's completely symmetric. One part of the wire will be f uh, feeling the same amount of force as the other part of the wire. What's the force on a wire? Well, there's infinitely, it's infinitely long. Infinity times constant. OK. So let's compute the force on this guy, for example. And then you'll know. So this is 1. So let's make this clear. 
force on two due to due to one. Well, let's get the magnetic field. The magnetic field for this one is going into the board. Correct? The magnitude is, see, I'm, I'm only concerned about this one. So when I write B, I'm writing the B due to this one. It's mu zero I one over two pi S. Fine. Now the force is I L cross B. It's I D L cross B but again, this constant. So in this case, it's, uh, let, let's just write the magnitude and figure out the direction. First of all, what's the direction? L is this way. B is into the board. find a w one word that will describe the force, the direction of the force. Huh? Okay, point. Don't point that way. towards B. So the only difficulty in this, this kind of problems, well, of course, integration setting it up, but direction. So the force is going to be this way. Yeah. The point is, it is attractive. So like currents, attract, so to speak, like charges repel. Yeah? All right. So in that case, let me write, write you the magnitude. It's the current on this wire, I2 times length of this wire, which is infinite, times B, which is mu zero I one over two pi S, and therefore force per unit length is mu zero I one I two over two pi S. To conclude, what's going to happen if you have this, the magnitude is the same. And you can see this expression is symmetric. The, this attract, there's of you know, equal and opposite attraction. But here, equal and opposite repulsion. There's a balance to the universe. Every little step is designed to Newton's third law kind of thing but it was not forced into this it just works out yeah I meant to do another problem but I surely don't have the time for it and that's why I did that example so uh, before you come to class tomorrow please uh, look at the example that I did about the rotating sphere